that's the one. Um, so, well, let's let's just go, really. Let's just see how we get on. Let's do intros first. So we'll start at the bottom of my screen. And that is Holly, weirdly enough. Hi, so I'm Holly and I'm a full-time hospital optometrist. I work in Sheffield. Um, mainly, my clinics are very varied, but mainly specialising more in diabetic retinopathy. Um, and I also locum the odd weekend as well. And I sit on the um, hospital optometry committee at the AOP. Nice. All right, then we will go to Gudgeon. Hello everyone, my name is Gudgeon. I'm a resident optometrist at a high street multiple. I uh, qualified originally as a dispensing optician, then as a contact lens optician, and now onwards as an optometrist. Um, outside of work, I'm involved with out of the work. Ah, got my own oh, business cool. name. <laughs> I'm involved with out of the box optics, uh, which my, my primary role is to look after pre-reg students. Uh, in the past three years, we've looked after over 500 pre-reg students from stage one, stage two, and the OSCEs. We run the OSCE masterclass, um, helping students and supporting them as and when we can. Uh, I'm an OSCE examiner for the WOPIC uh, MEX examinations. And um, so, yeah, that's me. Erica? Hello, I'm Erica. Um, I'm a domiciliary locum optometrist in South Wales and Hampshire. Um, I'm newly qualified and I do some MEX some WOPIC stuff as well. <laughs> awesome. Hi guys, so I'm Carmelo. I'm an independent optometrist uh, practitioner director in North London. Um, aside from running my own practice, I uh, run a third year, well, I supervise third year optometry clinics at Anglia Ruskin University. Um, I work with Gudgeon at, at Out of the Box Optics. We're uh, really passionate about optometric education, uh, particularly supporting and enriching optometry students at uh, the level which they uh, hope to qualify. Um, happy to be here, guys. Good to have you. Yep. And we've been going boy, girl, or girl, boy, girl, boy. So no offense here, but. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. Me next. Yep. Uh, so I'm a UK trained optometrist, uh, currently working in Dubai for Murfield as of October. So I've been here just a little bit over six months and my specialties are contact lenses and like Hamza, I'm a bit of an ocular imaging dork on the spare, on the side as well. Hope he doesn't mind. And yeah, that's pretty much me. And Hamza? Hamza, so yeah, my name's Hamza, optometrist for a multiple in the Lake Districts, miles away from any of these lot. And also on Instagram as a crazy optom. Zach's fellow I geek nerd slash dork, whatever you want to call him as well. <laughs> and Kay, you want to introduce yourself? So I'm Kay. I'm an optometrist based in Northampton, director of a, a practice called Tompkins Knight and Son. Uh, most people tend to know my uh, business partner, Brian Tompkins, is pretty well known within the profession. Um, I have quite a varied background. I have a, got my first degree at City. Um, spent a bit of time in the US, I have a US degree, came back, changed the way I practiced. I'd spent a lot of time in multi um, for multiples and after I came back from the States, decided really that I didn't want to be refraction centric is probably the best way of um, describing how, how, how things, I felt things were. Mm -hmm. So I do, I have IP, I do a lot of specialty contact lenses now um, and I just try and mix it up. Refraction is obviously very important. But like Hamza and Zach, love taking photographs, love sharing um, the things that we see because we do see some pretty cool stuff. And this little meeting is really just to share what we see with you guys in a informal, not quite a lecture, but let's try and learn something type environment that's not really stuffy. And, you know, what's maybe quite nice is that we all have our own Instagrams and hopefully anyone watching this, um, you know, they've seen the photograph and they've seen the little blog that we've put at the bottom, the little paragraph. Um, this is just to kind of fill that out a bit. So we tried to turn essentially what we would normally post into a bit of a sort of case study. Um, but it's also nice just to scratch each other's heads and, you know, ask each other, well, what would you do in this situation? Because, you know, I can only speak for myself. 
Um, but I'm sure everyone feels the same that there's some times where you just need to call a friend. You know, no matter how much experience you have, you need to ask for another opinion within the profession. So that was kind of how this all started. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, we have two people up today. We have Hamza and we have Zach. We have not decided who is going to go first. So let's call it. Uh, I'm going to call it in their heads and tails. Uh, okay. Hamza, call it. Yeah. All right, tails it is. Zach, you are up. You that can get your screen. Yeah, let me figure this out. One second. Or... Make sure your desktop's clean, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> he forgot his laptop at work. So he's I know. He's Conveniently. His Google Drive. All right, calm. I think that's worked. Wasn't it? All right. Yeah, sorry, I just put my plug in there. I realised nobody else is plugged in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to need Holly and Zach as the jump in at the end of this, because as a resident in practice, my kind of knowledge stops. Uh, once I've referred it on, then I need them not to jump in what happens on the hospital side as well, if they know. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Cool, so we got this patient episode that showed up. So patient presenting for a MEX with a red painful eye, went to the pharmacy originally, tried something over the counter, didn't work, so he came in. But his vision was worse, he came in wearing sunglasses, so it's pretty sensitive to light. No discharge, no headache, nothing else really. He's a diabetic, but goes to screening every year, not had any problems. On the right hand side here, you'll see some exam oops, oh, some examination information. So vision was slightly reduced in the right eye. Pressure slightly up in the right eye, but nothing more than what would be normal to consider the difference between the two eyes. And we got some pitch and back of the eye was unremarkable. There was no retinopathy nothing not going out of the back of the eyes. So if we look at the right eye here, firstly slit lamp exam, this is how the eye looked. Nice. Yeah. That looks, you know, have you guys seen, um, th there's someone on Insta at the moment who's been doing pictures of animal eyes. Mm. Have you guys really? seen that? Does, yeah. does that not look like one of those weird fish or bird yeah. eye things yeah. um, that have been floating around Insta? You know, in terms of yeah, the, our, our format, format for discussion, um, <laughs> can I just, if, can I ask you to go back one slide, Hamza, just to mention a couple of things, if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, in terms of us being practitioners, I think what's quite important is uh, looking for the things that the patient doesn't say. Uh -huh. So the fact that, you know, we've picked up that the patient's wearing sunglasses um, is an observation. And because the patient may not realize or be able to verbalize that they're sensitive to light. Yeah. Um, and um, the other thing to mention is um, I, I tend to ask is if the patient's tried drops and they haven't worked, uh, I do like to record what drops they were. Yeah. Um, and what kind of compliance they had because sometimes the drops are correct but the compliance is wrong or the drops for some reason um, aren't working. Yeah. No, so I'm, I'm assuming this patient is like every other patient in that they didn't know what drops from the pharmacy they got. Mm -hmm. Probably chloropanicol there. Right? Probably chloropanicol. <laughs> Probably tried it for one day and was like, it's not working, let me go see the optician kind of situation as they normally do. Yeah. But yeah. So anyway, so... The, end, the limbal region looked like this. You've got that, well, I want to say characteristic limbal glow. That's it. I've never seen a more textbook picture than I ever saw in this case, to be honest. Like it was a pure circumlimbal injection, a really, really deep injection. And then... Had you, had you ever had this before? Had you ever reported anything like this before? Um, this was the first one which was like... Like, I'd seen uveitis cases in the past, but they were never really... No, I'm from the patient. Had the patient ever said, oh, I've had something oh, like no, no. this before? So this was the first presentation for him. First presentation of a red eye like this, yeah. Okay. Um, his pain scale was quite, like, his pain was an eight, 8 out of 10, I think I remember. He was quite in quite a lot of pain, to be honest. So, yeah, that was the anterior eye there. So you can see the limbal injection. And then if we go to the anterior chamber, we've got some pictures here first. Oh, your favourite? <laughs> my favorite case to. favorite as well yeah and then you might see the cell you know in that first picture you showed in that first slide 
Oh. There. Is that can you is that cells that you're seeing in the left hand image? You know, mm -hmm. it's slightly off centre. No, that's just that the a... reflection off the corner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's not cells. If you no, call it, no, no, no. I I think I see. You know, on that that it's not the shiny one. The slightly the higher one. mag picture. No, yeah. but even that is just slightly indirect to the beam. It's just a reflection of the cornea. I wouldn't say it sells. Okay. Okay. But yeah, so there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we got a video as well. I might need to replay this, but let's see. Nice. I think this is the first one I ever recorded. I was like, you can probably see it this time. I tried it a few times in the past, it just didn't work out. It's tough. I mean, it's, you've got to get so bright. And if yeah, the patient's yeah. already photophobic and you're going, just, just sit still for a minute. I just want to take a photograph to show yeah. my mates. <laughs> um, well, Hamza, at this point, is, is the patient static or are you asking them to, to move their eye? No, no, they're static. I'm moving tell. the slit lamp and the illumination. Okay. Yeah. So, so what did you grade that as? I didn't really grade it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> how what, what, how, would, how would we grade that? it now? I would have graded that maybe 1 plus okay. or 1.5 plus. What would everyone else do? I'd need to look at it for longer than that. Sorry, Hamza. Yeah. Don't it's worry. Hard. <laughs> go, go back to the photo, Hamza, but that's probably the easiest way. Uh, that's probably. a much wider beam, though, as well, don't forget. Yeah, but you can... Uh, so when you've seen a few, and I'm sure the hospital guys will tell you this, when you've seen a few, you kind of get an idea. Okay. And, yeah, I, I'm, the big one for me, the big thing that's interesting for me there is the amount of flare. I was going to say, there's more flare than actual cells in this one. So, you know, that, that's significant flare there. Yeah. That's probably, mm -hmm. I don't know, what do, you, what, what do the hospital guys think? Probably like a two plus flare? One plus cells, two plus flare? Possibly. It's hard to tell in a photo, isn't it? It's much easier when you're actually on the slit lamp. But yeah, I think one plus cells, possibly two plus flare. Yeah, if we look back at the video, it's more mm. apparent here when you've got a smaller beam. Yeah. Yeah. Zach, what would you go for? Is Zach still there? Is Zach there? <laughs> he's left. He's like, oh, he's, he's muted himself. Zach, you're muted. He's, uh, he's, lost in his, he's lost in his computer. Yeah, my yeah. technology let me down here. Um, yeah, so I just, the same as everyone else. Um, I think once you've seen a four plus cells um, and you've seen, you know, a whopping hypopian, mm. you know, one or, one or two cells is, you know, you're, you're kind of expecting it, especially if you've worked in a cataract clinic. Yeah. For anyone that's done any sessions in a cataract clinic, you know, quite often now we give the, di the diabetic patients something before and after to stop the, um, you know, the leaky blood vessels producing something probably quite like what you can see here almost. Um, you know, and you just treat it and treat it quickly. And, uh, you know, that will resolve quite quickly in cataract patients. Obviously, we've got something else going on here. What are you yeah. giving them, that pre pre op yeah. for the cataract yeah, patient. patient or cataracts? Um, if, if it was something like this, you'd probably just give them a course of decks just to get them through, um, just to get them through the healing period. At, at, at this point, they're already on quite a lot of drops. You know, we see them at three weeks, and at that point, most of them have had, you know, they've had their antibiotics steroids they should have if they're diabetic um, but some slip through the net and then just another short course of steroids and then they're back on track generally. Ollie? Um, for post-op cataracts is this? No yeah. so actually the, 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 yeah post-op cataract but actually what I was going to the, the, the question I had for that kind of was so would you would you with the diabetics would you pre-op steroid them or NSAID them to try and calm it down? If they had cells pre-op because I know yeah. some some private clinics are quite. They will kind of pre-op. I've I've seen it in a couple of pre a, a couple of um, private clinics where they pre-op them on the NSAID just to kind of get them geared up. Uh, for we, for we don't often well in Sheffield we don't often do pre-op drops. 
Okay. Okay. I don't know really how that's going to change with COVID because it looks like they're going to be doing the, the suggesting bilateral cataract surgeries. Okay. Yeah. Wow. The other thing is um, quite a lot, quite a lot of the diabetics, if we're not giving them steroids, we'll give them something like Acular or Cartilac, so a non-steroidal, um, because they're at more risk of things like macular edema from the um, resulting swelling as well. So, mm. you know, it's a good thing to know. Try and, try and sort of beat the swelling to it and calm the eye down, um, especially in the patients you think are likely to um, have these issues. Yeah, so... That was, that was pretty straightforward in terms of the case up until that point. Mm -hmm. But then there was a curveball here. So if we look closer, now bearing in mind this patient had no retinopathy whatsoever and no previous treatment as far as he said, but quite significant rubiosis here on the pupil margin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this one caught me off guard a bit because we all think, yeah, they'll have really bad proliferative at the back of the eye, it's fine. And it's just like, yeah, okay, closer here. And there's all this going on as well. That almost yeah. like a Chansky picture. <laughs> yeah, like a painted one. Yeah, yeah. It almost doesn't look real. It looks, it looks too, too good to be real. Yeah, I beat your digital system. That's what it is, Kay. Total rubiosis is so difficult to spot as well. Um, it's obviously a bit easier with the light, lighter um, irises, yes. but you see them. On someone with um, sort of dark brown irises, you know, you really need to you really need to be looking out for little subtle signs. Um, and then if you have a gonio lens, that's another useful thing just to check the um, directular meshwork, see what's going on there. Quite often. So where where does the rubiosis start, Zach? Well, you put me on it now, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't know, to be starts, honest. It, um, it starts pupillary and works its way out. Does it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. so the easiest place to kind of look for it is at the pupil. Well, of, of the places to look for it is probably at the pupil margin because it comes around the back. And is that because of the VEGF and the flow of aqueous from the back to the front? Uh, is that I'm, why it normally lands there first? I have no idea, buddy. That's, yeah, back at you. That's, <laughs> I think that's an out-of-the-box... Question. Yeah. yeah. Well, to be honest with you guys, my, my my opinion on this, I think the first thing to mention is that when you've got lighter coloured irises, if you look closely enough, you can see the pattern of CD vessels. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if you look at this image, um, I I can imagine maybe um, some uh, maybe new, newly qualified optometrist glazing over this. They they may um, notice the vessels, but not necessarily link it to rubiosis, unless, of course, there are other associated signs, which, you know, are, are, are end symptoms, which is quite obvious in this one. Um, quite interesting, really, seeing this like l level of rubiosis at this level, and the pressures are 18, mm -hmm. Hamza? Yeah, they weren't raised at all. This is why it threw me off completely, because I was like, hold on, what am I seeing here? Am I actually seeing this kind of situation? Yeah, because... I mean, you know, you look hard enough and you will see ciliary vessels. Yeah. And if we, if we go back to our anatomy lectures, you get this kind of ring, pupillary ring, and then you get branches of the, of the ciliary vessel. So um, I'd say, you know, when you were looking at this on slit lamp, you probably didn't see this straight away, did you, Hamza? No, because obviously, especially when you're looking at a red-eye patient, you're focusing on that. But the point of this yeah. is that you still need to look at everything as a picture as a whole and not rush to one diagnosis necessarily before having a look at everything. I think, I think that's something that, um, I think particularly, I, I mean, we're, we've all been qualified reasonable about a years now, but when you're newly qualified, the first thing that blow you away is the red eye. Mm -hmm. When you see it like yeah. that, you're like, oh, wow. You know, yeah. if you're like us and you're all a bit geeky and you love all this kind of stuff and you're mm. like, wow. And then you go a bit deep and then you see your first cells and flare yeah. and you're like, Ah, oh, my own <laughs> cells and flare. There's just so much flooding in at that, yeah. at that time that sometimes it's easy to miss. I mean, I do it sometimes. I get so caught up in doing the exam. I'll do something and then I'll end up going away to write up notes and the patient is still in the chair and then I'll go, uh, yeah, maybe I should check that. <laughs> yeah. You After you go and think, well, actually, let me go back and do that. 
But yeah, it just goes to show that obviously, you know, red eye, red flag. But you know, if, if the red eye wasn't there, you know, you could quite easily glance over a lot of, yeah. I know, a lot of the aspects of this so far. So then... quick, quick question for Erica, because you, you've been a little bit quiet, Erica. When you <laughs> do your dummy work, do you get yeah. like a slit lamp? Do you get like a portable slit lamp um, or anything like that? Do you have anything like that? Not as of yet. So I'm just using direct at the moment. Yeah. Um, but we do have like portable fundus cameras, which are nice for the back. But yeah, nothing for the front yet, really. Okay. Hamza, mm. I just wanted to ask, I mean, you've, this is two images of the same eye. Yeah, one's just higher mag. Yeah, one's just higher mag. And the other eye, what did it look like? The other eye was fine. That's the thing. It was unilateral. Everything okay. was just going on in this one eye. And, and ciliary vessels weren't prominent in the other eye? Not really, no. Genuinely, the other eye was completely quiet. Everything was going on with this just one eye. <laughs> I think the, wow. other, the other thing it brings up, which is quite interesting, I don't know if you guys ever thought about this, is... Um, when diabetic screening just dilates yeah. without any kind of pressure assessment, angle assessment. Yeah, the, well, I think and then the numbers I think they were quoting was, what was it, 10,000 to 1 is yeah. the likelihood of angle closure if you don't check anything. Yeah. Has yeah. anyone actually ever had a case of angle closure in practice? Yeah. You mean oh. induced? No. Yeah. I've oh. had one where um, the patient's pressure went quite high but it calmed down shortly after because i called the ophthalmologist uh, i was uh, this was during my pre-reg um i called the the ophthalmologist at the hospital and the pressure had gone up by probably maybe five or six um but it was already slightly high in here so it went up from like 20 to 26 and then the ophthalmologist just said look um wait another half an hour and if it hasn't come down or it's gone higher then call me again um, and it just came back down again. And uh, that's the nearest I've had um, anything like that. Nothing more, uh, nothing more dramatic than that. I've had a couple. One, one lady had actually did have, had, PI, had actually had open PIs. Mm -hmm. And I dilated her and it still went up. And I just, <laughs> uh, you feel a bit small, but you just deal with it. You're like, okay. That, that's quite a hot topic at the minute with the, um, with the sort of, non poag group so pis only help if you've got some iris bombay so essentially something that's pushing the, the fluid forward causing the iris to bow if you have an anterior ciliary body that's naturally going to close off the angle so pis are, are done less and less now because if you've got an anterior ciliary body the only thing you can do is cataract surgery and i know a microcoma clinic we had we had you know, patients that were, you know, even, even as young as 40s, that, um, you know, their angles were so narrow, there was some uh, sinecus starting to form, and we just had to do cataract surgery on them, even on six, five eyes, because, you know, that's, that's the direction they were heading. So, PIs uh, no, aren't actually done as much as they were before. Sorry, Zach, so there was no PI involved at all with that patient who was pre presbyopic No, because the PI only works... Uh, essentially, if, if the ciliary body is pushed forward, it pushes the iris forward, which closes the angle. And that's just an anatomy issue. So you can put as many holes as you want to in the iris, and it's not going to affect that anatomy. The only thing is to relax the zonules from cataract surgery and insert an IOL. If, if the iris is bowed forward because there's some type of, you know, adhesion or limiting the flow of aqueous over the lens through the pupil. That's where PI helps because essentially it's like putting a hole in a parachute because it's bowed forward. And the other thing is they've stopped doing PIs and brown eyes in a lot of clinics because they're so thick, the, the, um, the irises. Yeah, my, my dad had to have um, a PI done uh, just for narrow angles and he had to go in twice um, and both times he was there for quite a while um, because of the amount of pigment, pigment he has in his, uh, in his iris. Yeah, I've seen a few cases where they've done PIs, but I'm seeing two, three holes sometimes in some patients. And you think, okay, fair enough. I think, I think also, I think, I don't know if, um, I, maybe it was me, maybe I wasn't paying attention at uni. Mm -hmm. That could have been the case. 
But I think a lot of people think that once you've had a PI, that's it, that angle will never close. And once you've had a PI, that just stops them having an acute attack of angle closure. So you can watch the angles because you like, like Jack was saying, you still get chronic angle closure from anatomical changes um, behind the iris. So I think sometimes people think PI is the answer, but you still have to kind of be a little bit careful not to just assume just because they've got a PI that yeah. they might be susceptible to um, their angles narrowing and closing. The other thing is that quite often we see PIs and think, oh, you know, that's just a little hole in the iris. Like, you need to remember the iris is there for a reason. And I've seen quite a few people in the cosmetic lens kind of like this really bothered by the double vision or the glare that they get from it as well. But we have to give them, you know, some type of colored centered contact lens to deal with it. Um, we've done a small study. There wasn't that many patients, but um, looking at where the PI and if that affects how it's, um, how it's, I don't know, uh, experienced by the patient. So if it's superior or to the temporal side, we didn't find any difference between the patients, but there is an idea that because of the tear meniscus in the upper eyelid, if the PI is on the top, it's more likely to catch the refracted light as it comes through. We didn't find anything. It's not to say that it's not, it doesn't, but. Uh, what are they doing, Holly, up in Sheffield? I, the ones I've seen out of Moorfield when I was in London Clinic, they've started to move them to, um, towards more the horizontal, um, sticking them in the horizontal meridian. I think so. I mean, the, in Sheffield, they don't have any optometrists in glaucoma clinics at all, um, which is slightly strange. Uh, but um, I think PIs have done less and less, and it's definitely more, we have an SLT laser, so it's SLT that's been done much more frequently. Well, Go in, Hamza. Yeah, so obviously, we kind of talked about it a bit. So obviously, provisional diagnosis for this one was anterior uveitis and rubiosis. Well, we are, we very rarely get letters back from the ophthalmologist. It can be very hit and miss as to whether or not. Often they'll send you a letter back when they schedule someone for cataracts, but the one you actually want to know about, they never send you back. So it's like, yeah, a bit annoying. But yeah, so obviously- I'm sorry, have, you, have you tried after your name putting at the crazy ophthalms? My trial next we have we have like quarterly meetings, six monthly meetings, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll send letters out to you guys. Never happens. Yeah, of course not. We've been oh, hearing that for years. Letter. Oh, all hell breaks loose. At least you get those promises. We're just like, nah, you're not getting them. So they don't even they don't even pretend that they're gonna send us letters. <laughs> But yeah, so from like a hospital point of view, like Zach, Holly, what would happen to this patient on the other side if you ever worked in like UBI screen before? Um, so I suppose the question is whether because of their rubiosis, they've got cells. Mm. Um, and if they've got rubiosis due to diabetic retinopathy, it is likely there's maybe some um, element of uh, proliferative going on. So they would, if it was, if they thought they kind of went down that route of the rubiosis, they would be treated with PRP. Um, but in terms of um, the, if it was just more the acute anterior uveitis that was being treated, if they turned up to eye casualty, for instance, they, um, in Sheffield, they would be given, um, well, usually would be pred forte on an hourly basis for a week, drop down to two hourly the next week, and so on. Um, and also a week's worth of cyclopentylate three times a day, um, mainly due to to help with the pain and also to reduce the risk of sinecki. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with Holly. I, yeah, I agree with Holly entirely about the drops in the regime. Yeah. It would just be interesting to know, you know, was it actually the uveitis that caused, you know, what, what's the source of this rubiosis? Because obviously whenever you've got these fine vessels, they're more likely to leak. So is it a true uveitis? Yeah. Or, you know, what what's what's sort of going on here? Um, it'd be yeah, it'd be interesting to know a bit more about it. Does anyone want to have a punt at a diagnosis? I I I want to say something. I don't know if I'm right. Go ahead. And Go ahead. I, I see. I want to throw out that that could be an ocular ischemic syndrome. Okay. And my because it's so one sided, and they're diabetic. I'd also be thinking, are there something wrong with this person's carotids? Mm -hmm. 
um, affecting flow. And if the better looking eye, if the carotid is messed up in that eye, that's why it doesn't look as bad. Okay. Mm -hmm. Usually with carotid, um, if there's a carotid problem, they tend to get quite deep blot hemorrhages though, from what my, I've seen. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. I'm just throwing out textbook stuff, really. I mean, it, you know, you, you kind of read about this stuff. And I wish I saved the fundus bit. It would be good to show. It was completely normal at the back of the eye. Mm -hmm. There was no issues yeah. on both. There's a puzzle at this one. Yeah. I mean, did you dilate, Hamza? Huh? Did you dilate? No. Straight um, on. Not with, no, no. When you see those vessels, I'm like, I'm not dilating this. But, yeah. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Keep the IOP at 18. Don't touch yeah. that. Nope. Yeah. Out of yeah. curiosity, was there any changes to, to the discs? Or is this too early on in the rubiosis for the discs to have changed? The pressure wasn't up though, that's the thing. Yeah, but if it continued, would it be normal tension and then once it got to the angle, then they'd have like a closed attack? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, no, so Erica, normal tension wouldn't work like that. So, so normal tension, w w they would have glaucomatous changes Oh, but the pressure, pressure is just less than less than twenty one, right? Um, <laughs> which is not normal tension. But I mean, the, the, the whole definition of glaucoma is, is very dependent on your location. So if you're in the, the far east, their mean pressures are like fourteen, I think. So pretty yeah. much everyone gets the diagnosis of normal tension because the definitions were predominantly based on Western populous I believe yeah um, whereas if you go to um, the Caribbean their average IOP the higher like 18 or 19 anyway yeah yeah so I mean the definitions of glaucoma are probably a little bit dated in terms of where the numbers are but they're so set in stone that and again it's a big thing for the students I think I think they hear 21 or if they've you know if they've kept up with nice and stuff like that they hear 24 26 and they look at it and not just students actually that's unfair to say that many many practitioners look at it as like a like this one-off thing that's that you know uh, is the answer to everything but there's so many factors but for the guys who have been in a glaucoma clinic you know I see, you sit there and you see someone come in with a 20 six and as a newbie i probably would have gone oh my god now we can just kind of look at it and go uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah there was this um there was this saying one of the old consultants and it was you know you can be in the 30s for months 40s for days and 50s for hours and once you kind of think of it like that you know if you're in the 20s you're, you're still talking you know you're going to get potentially years of vision Mm. They're still in that range, um, and it, it's you know for someone coming into practice, it's quite good to know you know the time limit because as the primary eye care experts, you know that we are we're seen as um, you know a lot m most of our job is just finding out how bad it is and how soon we need to really send it in. Yeah, just um, a question for the hospital guys. Um, just to clarify, Holly, are you at Medical Retina? medical or did you mention diabetic retinopathy uh, yeah yeah so I, I, I work in med rat and I've done my med, med rat certificate as well awesome so I just wanted to ask how often you see cases of proliferative uh, um, of iris rubiosis without any proliferative signs at the retina because this right. is this is what it is right <laughs> yeah very well, rare. Yeah, yeah I think I think if you see any rubiosis you start looking at the retina again. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, because often, often I, I think, um, if I remember correctly, throughout our, our optometric edu uh, our education, it's something that you expect at a late stage um, with, you know, proliferative signs at the, at, at the disc elsewhere before you even see them in the iris. Mm -hmm. And if it was unilateral, you might be thinking more, have they had a, you know, um, central vein, medical vein occlusion or something in the past yeah. and you're seeing it in them now or something. Because I know Hamzi said that the history wasn't, you know, very colourful, you know, yeah. with hospital visits because 
my initial thought was diabetic, proliferative, and has went in for a round of heavy laser, yeah. which has caused inflammation, you know, which has stirred this whole pot up possibly. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to work from the back forward. Yeah. Um, because rubiosis from, in, from the glaucoma side of it, yeah. you know, that, that's got a really bad prognosis because once you block up that trabecular meshwork, all you can really do at that point is limit the production of aqueous. So you're talking ciliary body ablation or cyclodiode. Um, and, you know, they, they lose vision fast because those pressures are in the 40s and uncontrollable quite often. Yeah. Interestingly, interesting story, sidebar, sorry, because you mentioned oh. cy cy cyclodiode. I, was, I, used, I used to do some sessions uh, in the glaucoma clinic at St. Thomas's. And we had a lady come in and she'd had cyclodiode and she was about, she'd just come in for a quick check. It was just a case, let's make sure pressures are down. And she's come in and I've put her on the gold and I've just started cranking it up, cranking it up, cranking it up, cranking it up. And I've got to like 60 plus. Wow. And she'd had cyclodiode. And she was sitting there, I swear, happy as. She was like, yeah, I'm fine. Everything's all right. Yeah. So, I've, you know, I've bricked it because I've not seen a 60 plus. That For me, that was, my comfort zone was totally shot at that point. So I've, I've gone off to the consultant and I've gone, uh, you know, this lady's pressures are like 60 plus and she's, she's had cyclo. And he's kind of looked at me like, all right, mate. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. You still don't know how to use your gold medal. still got her RGP in. That's yeah. what it is. So he's gone, I'll bring her over. So I brought her over. He's put her on the machine. And I'm, I don't need to watch that. I'm just watching the dial on the Goldman. And I'm just watching him go. Uh, and I'm, <laughs> in my head, I'm just thinking. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I do know how to do Goldman. Uh, so he's cranked it all the way up. And, um, and he's just looked at me and gone. Yeah, it is quite high, isn't it? And <laughs> so he wanted, he wanted to do more treatment. And the lady, and the, and the lady, she, she wasn't young, but she wasn't old. Um, for, those, for those people who've worked in glaucoma clinic, young is less than 60, old <laughs> is over 80. So okay. they're kind of, no, over 90 is probably old. Everyone else is considered regular patient. And she's gone, oh, but I'm going on holiday to Ireland tomorrow. And yeah. you know, and I just can't come in. So he's gone. Okay, he's just written out some Diamox. He went take this a couple of times a day. I think uh, Diamox uh, either twice a day or four times a day. Yeah. Um, for however long you're away, and then come back and see us, and we'll worry about it then. So if, if if there is any students watching, essentially Diamox is a pretty hardcore drug. Like it is hard on your system. Any patients that you see takes it. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone else, if you've seen anyone on here, Claire, you've probably seen one or two. Like, you know, patients get the shakes really badly, like they can't eat. Quite yeah. often you have to have, you know, stomach lining tablets on it as well. Um, they get pins and needles a lot in their hands um, and things too, don't they? Yeah, a lot of pap patients, don't you? Papilledema ones they put on diamonds, don't they? It's, it's a hardcore drug, like. Yes. You aren't, the answer is yes, Hamza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. like, often they will tell them to eat bananas because yeah. of potassium drops. Potassium. Um, and if they have liver problems, is it liver or kidney? Kid kidney problems. They have to be really careful with diamox because it, it basically it's the, the the bare bones of it is it's sucking the water out of them, Ooh, and, nice and, that, and yeah. it puts their kidneys under a lot of duress. So a lot of duress. So they have to be have to be careful uh, with with that. Um, did you ever get an answer? Nope. Uh, to be decided. That, that's, that's, that's the most frustrating thing about high street practice in that sense is you want to learn and you do occasionally get some interesting cases and it's like, yeah, I've sent them on the way now. Like, yeah. And no offense, like when you call patients, sometimes they're like, oh yeah, I don't know. I was in and out of the room. I don't know. He gave me some drops. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a regional thing, Samza. I, I work in Bedford. Um, yeah. because I do lots of stuff all over the place for some reason. And in Bedford, so there, so Bedford did a Moorfield out clinic. Yeah. So uh, Moorfield has taken over Bedford's eye department and they send letters for everything. Oh. So this patient, have, this patient, came, sorry, 
as a policy, care, um, yeah. this is a Murfield's policy. You know, it's not a complete consultation without a letter being sent. It, it's fantastic. It's fantastic learning experience. It, it's a regional thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in hospital defence, um, it's, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's sometimes quite difficult because some um, referral letters are just signed by the optom and the name is not printed. Um, so it's, I mean, you could go and go and look up their GOC number and, but I mean, when you've got like 10 patients waiting. You ain't got time for that. No. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's, it's difficult sometimes. I think the GPs get more than we do. I think most time it standardly goes to GPs, but we're not often CC'd in. That's what it is. Yeah, I well, with us, like after, so we use Medisoft, um, and that generates after you've seen someone um, automatically a GP letter. But when you get referrals in, I don't think the um, the optometrist details is not necessarily put in. Okay. Um, so it would just gener generate it if they did that. But um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's another another point is that people move around um, practices quite a lot, patients, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, like I've got mates that have went on holiday to Newcastle for the weekend and got their eyes tested for whatever reason, you know, and, you know, they'll probably never be back there again. So it's, it's, it's obviously really good to send a letter um, and it should be, but quite often, you know, I always tell the patients, if you have a copy, bring it to any future eye appointments, mm -hmm. um, be that inside or outside the hospital. Um, I often will um, make sure that the patient also gets a letter with mm. what I'm saying. So, oh no, the patient ones are good because they do bring it in sometimes, and that's useful. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, to be honest, our trust is a bit crazy in the sense that the fax machine, like we got a cutoff date for that, and that caused global meltdown across everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, think the first day of it, running on emails, it got blocked in the inbox, and everything was bouncing back. So everyone was like, "Oh crap, what do we referral?" <laughs> It, it's it's a week. I, I had a patient uh, over COVID actually. Um, Kratoconic, um needed some emergency specs. Was trying to get a voucher out of the hospital service, and the hospital like we can only fax it. And they and we were like, well, we haven't had a fax machine in like a decade. Um, is it, you know can you not post it to us? They're like no, we can only fax. it. Um, that, yeah. we, we got around it again, but it was just like, okay. It's like, it, it's, um, whenever I think of fax machines now, I think of um, Outbreak. I don't know if you guys have seen that movie, Outbreak. It was a, uh, and it, weirdly, it's a pandemic movie. And this, oh, the Netflix one. No, you're thinking of Contagion. Contagion. Yeah. But um, Outbreak was, was um, Who's, it? who's that guy? But who's the Rain Man? Who's Rain Man? Uh, Justin, Justin Hoffman. So yeah, so they were there and this monkey bites this guy and he gets it and he gives it to this whole village and you know, that kind of stuff. And all I remember, one of the big things I remember is this fax goes through to the CDC and they're getting so many faxes, it falls off the fax machine and rolls under and rolls under the thing. So they miss it and you know, it, it's probably what happened to, you know, the 10 Downing Street when COVID yeah. kicked off, uh, <laughs> they, they lost the important piece of paper that said you might want to close things down a little bit sooner. While we're on, well, before we jump on Zach's, I've just downloaded it, I've got it ready. On the topic of rubiosis, I've got one here that was another one I saw. Surprising. Let me show you this. This is a pretty heavy one as well. That's oh, a whopper. Wow. Mm. wow. Is, and these are all your iPhone one, right? On yeah. Your, yeah. So, what they doing that tip? Uh, this patient. Oh, what was this one? She was completely blind in this eye at this point. Okay. Uh, it was a fixed dilated pupil. She had vitreo retinal problems as well. There was all sorts going on. That KP down there. E yeah. I've got a better one now though. But yeah, obviously, I think that pupil's dilated because of the fibrosis. Yeah. From the vessels forming, so that's why it's obviously in that position. And we can see that it's quite uneven, uh, uh, uneven shape also. Yeah. I wonder why it's on one side. Maybe she just sleeps on that side on the pillow. That's all I can come up with. Roll them over. <laughs> it could, it could be. It might be to do with the way the um, 
wh whichever way the blood vessel, whichever side the blood vessel, it, without getting into iris anatomy, I think the, the way that the um, uh, blood structure to that part of the eye is, I've got a feeling, and I may totally be wrong, I might totally be, you know, making this up, um, is that the, it's kind of sectoral, it splits, and half of the iris is uh, supplied from one part and the other eye is supplied by the other part. I don't know why okay. in my head that um, resonates, but I've, I've got a feeling it might be something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah so that's right down the middle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, let me get Zach teed up. Give me a second. Anyone ever, then, all right, like, at the moment, is everyone enjoying this? I don't know, I'm enjoying it. I, yeah. I think it's nice just yeah. to get yeah. things over. Um, and well, what I might do for the recording is because we've just got, we've actually done that, we're about 45 minutes on that, just, <laughs> just chatting it out. It might be worth splitting it into two. Yeah, um, but we'll worry about that. I mean, that, that, that the out of the box guys will make it look pretty with their nice colors, <laughs> look at psychedelic. Yeah, I want a theme tune, something like, like that. Oh Who edited the through the pinhole stuff? So it, it wasn't. It wasn't us. I mean, we oh, had collaborated. <laughs> 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 you know, it was. It wasn't us. It was um, Gautam at Locomotive. That was a good edit, man. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, he, he spent a lot of time. Uh, you know, expressing himself creatively. Everyone's had a lot of time. Having that <laughs> thing, everyone's had a lot of time whilst uh, they've been on. Yeah. Probably apart from the hospital guys. Yeah, I'm still full time the whole time. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've been pretty much full time as well. Okay. So Zach, this one's for you, buddy. Yes. You know, when I, when I tell my mum about uh, that, you know, I'm involved in teaching and things, the first thing she asks me is, why can't someone teach you how to tidy your room? <laughs> <laughs> That's Such like the brown mum line of always. So I've, I've, I've been, um, so I, so we've been going into practice. We start before, sorry, Zach, before you go in, we've been going All into right. practice. Um, and now we're sort of semi-open. We're doing essential care as well now. And so we go in and everything has to be wiped down At the end of the day we mop all the floors and stuff like that and my wife was like i'm gonna send your boss a picture of what what your parts of the house look like and ask them if they really trust you to clean the practice <laughs> crazy unbelievable all right go on zach um so yeah basically although my work's primarily hospital based. I've done quite a lot um, in the community as well, the locum work. And we always get asked, you know, people come in, I want to change the color of my eye. I want to try, you know, fresh look contact lenses for my night out or for my next Instagram selfie. <laughs> and the purpose of this was just to show other applications of um, cosmetic lenses, basically. Um, so yeah, next slide, Hamza. Broken this into two parts. Kao said you're allowed one sort of case study, so I didn't listen to him. Um, <laughs> it's actually in two parts. Okay. Um, so they are related, um, and I promise it's very similar. Basically, the background of this lady was 45 years old. Now, her vision was great, 6'5 right and left, um, but she was diagnosed eight months ago with jaundice. So as we all know that, sort of has a yellowing of the eyes, and that was her main complaint. She was under the gastroenterologist, yep, and she was getting regular follow-ups. The liver function wasn't stable at the minute, so this was still fluctuating almost daily, and um, it was really bothering her. Her main concern was her nephew's wedding that was on the horizon in a few months' time, so that was what she was really focused for. And if you flick to the next, one Hamza. What we've got is we've got a photograph of basically the eye. Now for anyone that does a lot of ophthalmic photography, I, I thought I could use this as a bit of a teaching point. You don't want to bleach the photograph, so you don't want to overexpose it in the attempt to get really clear blood vessels as you, as you can see on the right hand side. You're better actually dimming the light slightly or using the auto brightness function on a lot of um, 
automatic cameras. So if you flick to the next slide, where I've just turned the light down slightly, or just click it, yeah, you'll actually see how yellow the um, conjunctive mm. was. So Zach, quick question, sorry mate. Um, what did you take these images with? So they were, um, <laughs> it wasn't a phone. So they okay. were all with, um, it was the Topcon, or no, sorry, those were Hagstrite. Um, it wasn't the big fancy one, the BX900. I think it was the BX500, so it was a much more basic model. Okay. Um, but yeah, so. Slit lamp camera. Slit, slit lamp camera, camera in, in short, yeah. And yeah, you can see obviously there the issue. So from what I understand about jaundice, which is very small, is um, it's to do with this liver function breaking down hemoglobin. And the yellow is actually from Billy Rubin deposits. Now, that's about the extent of my knowledge on why it's yellow. But essentially, I'm just going to ask you guys, what would you do with this case? Because she's come to you as the eye expert. I would um, give her the option of a scleral lens um, or a uh, what's what used to be called a haptic lens. Uh, where the cornea would be empty, um, but it just covers only the sclera only um, okay. as an option, as a painted lens. Um, okay. You know, they'd have to appreciate that the cost, um, I mean, you know, you're looking at a good few hundred pounds in order for the fitting and the procedure to be done. Um, but if this is a patient whose priority is cosmesis and they've got the disposable means to uh, accommodate that, then it's uh, perfectly right to, uh, I think, to make that suggestion to the patient. So a uh, hard lens? Yeah, so a hard scleral lens. Yeah. Um, or a, um, uh, but there's different types of scleral. So you can have a painted scleral lens mm -hmm. or you can have a, uh, a, a haptic lens. So it's, a, a, as I said, it's a scleral lens, hard lens, um, yeah. but it only covers the sclera and leaves the cornea alone. Yeah, yeah. okay. Anyone else? I'd refer to Brian. <laughs> Fair point. I, I, me and Zach have spoken about this. I kind of know the answer. So I'm going to keep my mouth shut. You cheated. Yeah, I cheated. It's like, it's like being back at uni again. <laughs> Erica, what would you do? You've been quiet again. <laughs> I'm not sure, no. The sclera is a good option, but otherwise... I know they can get some drops that are supposed to brighten up the eye, but I'm not sure. That's a really good idea. They're really big in America, I white. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so I think it's just a phenylephrine sort of diluted in a diluted format, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but, it, but would it get rid of the yellowing? No. The phenylephrine is just going to shrink the blood vessels, right? So you're just going to mm. get, um, they're going to look less red. And more yellow. <laughs> and they might actually exacerbate the yellow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I, had a, I, had, I had a patient who was um, had really bad well he's got all uh, quite a few uh, problems that, that he presented uh, predominantly with a dry eye issue and he in california there's a guy who does um scleral whitening surgery okay which um interesting it didn't work for this guy but uh, i mean th this guy's dry eye was actually quite neuro neuro neuropathic as well so not much was going to help him but yeah it was interesting so you can actually get eye whitening surgery in the u.s is that from the that. donald is that from the donald trump university of injecting bleach into the body <laughs> i think um, i think i think he tried inserting a uv bulb somewhere <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, zach when you, when you asked the question instinctively i thought uh, of soft sclerals I've yep. worked on, um, on film sets a few years ago and um, the majority of, work, of our work was on soft sclerals to change the appearance of the, the, the iris and, and the sclera. Um, but we never had a painted lens that had a kind of opaque finish on the, the scleral area. It was more just to uh, enhance vessels or add vessels or change the color slightly, but to kind of um, replicate a natural off-white sclera, it's actually quite difficult to do. Um, yeah. The other issue about soft scleral lenses is that whenever we've worked with them, we've had to insert them for the actor, yeah. which is a problem because they're, what, 22 millimeters plus, and they often go in folded. 
Yeah. Um, we have to insert underneath the eyelid and kind of uh, fashion it to spread out mm -hmm. and then hope that it settles and hope there's not a bubble. <laughs> but I mean, if you're trying to, to, to teach a patient to do that, I can imagine it to be more difficult than a hard scleral. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's no, a good yeah. oh, point. No. So instinctively, I, I mean, I would have said a soft scleral, but it would it would depend who the artist is. <laughs> Hamza, do you want to flick on to the next yep. little bit? Wait, what? Good. So we'll, we'll come back to that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll I'll leave you there. <laughs> leave you there. This. So part two. This is quite a similar case. So in this example, it was a young boy, um, 11 years old, again, good vision, 6'5", both eyes. And the left eye had some um, sterile pigment from a birthmark. Hamza, if you just click the button, this photo yeah. should come up. Eyes are otherwise healthy. Now, this was a you know, pretty hefty birthmark. Um, and it was really, really noticeable as well. Um, Hamza, if you flick over, you'll actually see the full extent of the birthmark and how far it wow. actually goes back. So if you look at the bottom left and the um, bottom right, you can see exactly where the line stops. Um, and it was quite noticeable. Now, That's the one eye. Then, just the one eye, yeah. Now, the young boy wasn't too bothered. All his friends knew about it. It was kind of his little cool quirk in school. <laughs> but the time where it really bothered him was um, birthday parties. So whenever you're 11 years old, you know, thinking about going into secondary school. You meet quite a lot of new people at these sorts of events. And that was whenever it really bothered him the most. So Hamza, flick over. Sure. And again, I think we're in the same scenario as what we've done before. Um, yeah, we went with Carmelo's idea. Gudgeon, you could do that as well. Um, the only thing is the soft lens is a little bit more comfortable. Um, for someone that's gonna wear the lens part-time, you know, for someone that's going to wear it to a social event once a week, once a month, their lids never really build up the tolerance to the edge. No matter how flush a scleral lens is, you're always going to get some edge rub there. And that's where the soft lenses come in. So, yeah, this was 22 mil soft. And if you actually look at the lens itself, um, you can see the little blue and red blood vessels that we've put on there. Yeah. When I was looking into this, um, you can see the little reference at the bottom. I found this guy, and we came across this paper by Tomasello. So he's um, essentially an anthropologist. And they looked into this thing called the uh, cooperative eye hypothesis, which is quite interesting. So uh, quite often, I think the scleral is seen as the bit that holds the optic nerve and the cornea just together. You know, it doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, but for ev evolutionary purposes, um, it was quite useful in uh, social settings. So what, what the, the study looked at was they took uh, infants and uh, great apes side by side and essentially monitored, monitored them when they were looking at gaze and head movements. So the great ape followed head movements or head posture, whereas the young baby quite naturally or instinctively followed um, eye movements. And anyone will know that sitting at the back of a lecture hall when the lecturer says, here you, you know exactly who they're talking to, even if they're 150 meters down the, um, you know, at the, at the front of the, uh, the lecture hall. So I think we're naturally predisposed to take more notice of the sclera than um, you know, we probably do actually give it credit for. Um, and this is always noted in pseudo squints. So, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the lower lid's a bit more lax, so it looks like a hyper deviation. Um, and, you know, there's, there's loads of other examples. Um, but, yeah, basically, the, the social conclusion they came to was that we use it to try and find out where someone's looking and how much you can trust them. Um, and that's sort of built into us. Anyway, so that's a little bit of background. The lens itself, 22 millimeter soft lens from Cantor and Nissel with a clear iris. My God, you never looked anyone in the eye. <laughs> Did you need a prism, Zach, to maintain centration? On the on the lens, yeah. Um, That's a clear iris, they're, isn't they're it? slightly thick. I think they make them slightly thicker at the bottom, um, and actually go into the fitting process with um, the sort of part one. The lenses are quite flat, um, and they always are because you don't want to catch any bubbles under the lens. You want to make sure that that cornea is touching 
you know, on the apex. And one of the secrets I found, I don't know if you've done this, Carmelo, was just put in a really good thick artificial tear. Yeah. It's nice and biscuit, so it doesn't go everywhere. Well, it goes down the cheek. But um, yeah. it's not going to move. It's not going to fall out. And um, no, that's your best friend whenever you're dealing with the big lenses. For sure. Of course, giving this 11-year-old a bit of a warning that his vision is going to be blurred because he's used to 6-5 vision. Yeah. And you're going to have some um, reduction in quality of vision because he's, even though he's wearing a Plano lens, it is a lens after all. You're going to get some sort of aberrations, absolutely. Yeah. How long do you wear these lenses for? They're quite thick and they use, it's quite a rubbery material. So I think they've got quite, um, quite a high silicon content. I'm, I don't think the painted section has much um, oxygen transmissibility. With this lens, although the center is actually quite thin, um, so you'll get plenty through there. It is a lens, as I said, that's mostly used for social occasions. You're wearing it for five, six hours at a time. And it's not going to be super comfortable. Um, I was, uh, no, sorry, finish that and I'll, I'll tell my story. No, um, I was just going to say that you will get some tear exchange under the lens as well, um, just through the pump mechanism, through blinking. So Cantor are based in Northamptonshire. Um, their, their, soft, their soft lens um, manufacturing process, not too far from where we are. And they're really, really nice guys. So if you reach out to them and go, can we come and have a look at your factory? They're always happy to have Optoms come in and have a look. So we went in and we and we had a look. And so they did like the Game of Thrones eyes um, and stuff like that. So me and Brian absolutely like geeked out over like the White Walker's eyes <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. It's amazing how they have to do it in certain in certain um, levels. Um, they, they've they've got a photo of. Um, one of the old MDs and they've made a, I can't remember, it was 17 or 18, no, must have been, I can't remember. They basically made a contact lens for an elephant eye. I've seen that one, it's huge. Yeah, and and so they, they did that, I think the elephant had like an abrasion or something, but it, it was really quite interesting. But they were telling me a story about when they made um, uh, Rogue One for, you, for, for the Star Wars fans out there. Um, and they had Donnie Yen was wearing those, um, you know, the, the contact lenses that made him look blind, that gave him the frosted, um, frosted corneas. Yeah. And basically they said, yeah, when, when they fitted those, uh, the fitter had, was, was under strict instructions to tell the director that they could only be worn for X amount of hours, and then they had to come out. Otherwise, they were going to end up with a real blinded Donnie Yen. Um, so they, they were, they, they, the director was told, look, if you want, you can use them, but you can only use them for X amount of time. Otherwise, you're going to damage, damage the actor. On, then, the, uh, on the movie front, there was one of my colleagues at Murfield's um, that had Tom Cruise for, I think it was Rogue Nation. Do you know where he's on the side of the plane? Yeah. yeah. And uh, essentially, from all the, you know, wind gush debris it would have just sliced through his corneas so he was fitted with full diameter 23 millimeter spherules to protect his corneas for that scene which i thought was quite interesting wow. it's the only reason he can keep his eyes open during the scene there's somebody them. on instagram who does purely like specialist lens fittings her accounts are really interesting i don't know the name off the top of my head oh it's but... um they've got a practice in london as well haven't they yeah, yeah. that's the one film work i work for film i work i work in gloucester road London. Yeah. yeah I think her name's she did the behind the vault thing, but she does a lot of them as well. Um, uh, specialist lenses, like for movies and stuff. Really interesting stuff to see, to be fair. A friend of mine used to uh, fit uh, contact lenses for a um, uh, Brian Conley. And uh, what would happen is uh, they would pick her up in a limousine from her house, wow. take her to the show. She would just insert his contact lenses, sit there and watch the show, and then um, at the end of the evening, take his lenses out for him, get put in a limo and taken home. And this was every Saturday night for how many ever weeks? And she got paid quite handsomely for, handsomely for it as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if these kind of gigs are still out there, but 
I, 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 I had a patient who had a botched cataract. It is, is, the, only, is the only way to describe it. And he was amblyopic in one eye. The good eye cataract didn't go... Botched is, is, is unfair on the surgeon. Um, the cataract uh, didn't, was slightly complicated on the, on the better eye and was left with um, plus 12s um, because, you know, he was, he was, a, he was an A-fake uh, while they're waiting for everything to heal before they could put in a new lens. But this guy was so sensitive about touching his eyes, he had to do it, he had to have it under a GA. Uh, so he, he was struggling with the glasses and he's like, I want contact lenses, but I don't want to put them in and take them out. And I really hate it when people touch my eyes. Uh, yes, you've got to see that patient. Yeah. <laughs> Insert the lens, see them again, send them. In the end, we just, I just put him a monthly. I was like, here, uh, yeah. that works, go away. And he came back and then once he was ready for cataract, we, we took we, so every month he would come in and we would just change the lens for him. Okay. Yeah, we have quite a few like that in the hospital um, who are AFAKs who come in every month and have their lens changed by us. Okay. Right, do flick on there, Hamza? Yeah, sure. Part one, um, so part, one part two. <laughs> Not confusing. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> basically, we're back to the first case. Um, so the first, the first one's just what we're dealing with, basically, the LOI. Um, Hamza, if you flick onto the next one, it's an example of the um, trial lens that gets sent. Sorry, that, that photo came out awful on this screen. That'll do, Hamza. Basically, if you look at the, um, the lens just that I'm holding, you can see a top and bottom. Essentially, that's for orientation. The lenses have quite high water content, so they don't wet very well. Um, as you can see, there's one little drop um, just of solution on there, and it's, you know, it's not beating like what you would really expect from a lens. Um, this is also a good idea to get the patient to take some selfies, take some pictures, have a look in the mirror, and just see the area that the lens is going to cover, because a lot of this is managing expectations as well, which is important. As you can see, the lens, top to bottom arrows, slightly off to the side. It was sitting a little bit loose, so I just tightened up the base curve, um, and it fell in nicely. Click a few there, Hamza. Yeah. Yeah, so again, that's just letting the patient see whereabouts the lens is gonna sit. And the final lens there, you've got top to bottom, um, you know, nice stable lens. At this point, with really whatever, is back, isn't it? That you've got a textbook photo for the presentation. Convenient. <laughs> it's nice, yeah. <laughs> it, it, uh, that's another thing. Photographs, you know, the ones that we post, and I'll be very honest, that it's one in 50 that you take. You know, it's a very, very, you know, scarce in comparison to the amount that you do take. I will second you on that one. Everyone's <laughs> like, how do you always take good photos? Like, yeah, you don't see the 50, 60 a scrap because the focus is off, it's too bright, I've got lens flare, the colour's off, no. Patient blinked. Yeah, absolutely. Patient fell out um, of the chair. It was awful. <laughs> so you I, know, I'm um, talking about falling out of chairs, I was um, in a practice once and they changed our chairs to the saddle type ones. I like the saddle one. <laughs> no, I, I, I like them now, but my first time using it, I um, leaned back very... Uh, enthusiastically from the slit lamp once and I flew, I, I, was, I was in the air and I landed on my back. And, uh, and I was on the first floor. So everyone downstairs uh, heard the, um, uh, the, earthquake. the earthquake that was caused by <laughs> me landing. Um, luckily my patient found it more amusing than incompetent. Um, but yeah, good times. You know, you know those stools have an ejector button. So there's one to adjust height and for some reason on these stools, it has no yeah. back. But there's a lever, if you pull it, it just tips backwards. Like, you've had enough, so there, I've gone. Sounds like a man talking from experience there, Hamza. <laughs> yeah. When I first installed 100%. it, yeah, not gonna lie. <laughs> but I was like, what does this lever do? And then, vault gone. The, the only thing is with these saddle chairs is that they're quite comfortable for guys, but if ever I need a female colleague to use that chair to check a patient, they spend two minutes trying to figure out how to sit on it while still maintaining some sort of decorum. Um, so yeah, is uh, one thing that we learned with those chairs that they're uh, yeah, yeah, to be worn with trousers, uh, to be sat on with trousers only. 
Yeah. Uh, lenses. <laughs> Uh, essentially, with the birthmark patient before, what was quite nice is I could just send Cantor and Missile a photograph of the um, sort of normal eye or the regular eye, and they could try and match it to that. So he had quite a lot of, um, you know, bluey pigmented hues, which is why um, he had more blue um, vessels painted um, or sort of, you know, darker pigment areas. With this, we obviously couldn't match it. So we just tried to match it as best as we could. And it's not 100%, you know, I'm not claiming that it is in any way, but it's really good in primary position. So if you look at maybe the central photograph or even the one on the left, in primary position, there's not that much of the sort of yellow conjunctiva sclera showing. Um, and she was really happy. She went out for the day, um, sent me some photographs afterwards, um, wow. of, you know, what she was happy with. Um, and she still does wear it occasionally when she's going out to social events. Um, so yeah. That's the case. How do you have to store them, dude? When, um, if, you know, if you're intermittent wearing them like that, um, how, how do you store them? Shameless plug. Um, the, 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 you do, you, some of the Bosch and Lom cases do go up to 23 millimeters. Yeah. We recommend generally changing solution once a month. What do you put um, BioTrue? Or any, any BioTrue bio out here. Um, we would use quite a lot of Quattro. Um, whenever we were at Murfields, London. It's a lot softer, Quattro's a lot softer on cosmetic um, mm -hmm. lenses. The back we doesn't rub off quite, quite so much. I don't know if you found that, Holly. Yeah, yeah, Quattro is kind of the one that we use. But I find it's that quite, still quite a lot of the cosmetic lenses, they just cut there, like it does fade. Um, or, you know, you can you start to see the black opaque through them and then uh, you can send them for reopaking. We used to use OT Clean whenever we were dealing with soft scleros. Very, very kind to, uh, to the to silicone material. Yeah. And it's the one that, so we used to use Contour before Cantor and Nissel. Anybody use Contour? Contour 55 um, lenses, but whenever they had their artist paint on the, on the, um, on the, uh, the lens itself, they'd always recommend OT Green. So actually on that, what, um... What lens companies would you use for something like this or, you know, a, an iris color that you needed? Um, what's your go-tos? We, we, the two we use are Canter and number seven. Yeah. Are the two that we, we, we use. Um, we, do, we, we have, we, we don't have many uh, cosmetic lenses. We have a couple that, that we've need to see. We've had one lady who, who's really particular really particular unbelievably particular um blue eyes sorry some some sort of bluey greeny gray eyes that it's just impossible to match i refuse to see her so i don't even know uh, <laughs> but she's one of brian's patients she's happy being brian's patient brian i'm happy for her to keep seeing brian but uh, i mean i think i think we got to the point where number seven were like you you guys can walk we've we've done everything uh, with with this, and we'd look at it and we go, that's, that's amazing! Wow! Mm -hmm. And she'd put it on, and go, no, it's it's not right. She's really particular about it. But um, they they the, I've, I've met the guy who does the painting, the hand painting at, at Canter, and the, and he's awesome. The stuff he does, you just kind of sit there and go, wow. What kind of paint do they use? This is just a random one. They have no. They have. They make. They have it made specially. They have this paint made specially because it has to all meet CE approval and has to go through all the like the harmful to make sure it, because it's it make sure it's not going to harm the eye, uh, make mm -hmm. sure it's non toxic. The paint is like outrageously expensive, outrageous. Like for a, for, a, for like a, a pot that big was like I remember three or four grand something like that. It's, yeah, it's outrageously expensive. It's pretty non-toxic. Right? It has to be totally non-toxic. has to be stable. They don't want it to fade because then that affects the how, how the colour looks. Um, yeah. or, you know, and, and you don't want it to lose that. Um, but, I mean, the guy sits there and he's sitting there and he's painting on a button. Um, these things. And 
So if you were to paint two eyes and you wanted them to look exactly the same, you would have to paint them side by side and treat them exactly the same time. Because yeah. the next day, if you came back and you tried to do it exactly the same way, there's no guarantee that they would look exactly the same. But that, that's a good point, actually, that with the hand-painted lenses, you know, as hard as you try, you're never going to get, you know, if you order one and then another one in a year's time, it's never going to look quite the same. If you did go for something like ultra vision, like a printed lens, um, obviously it's a lot more repeatable. Um, but I guess you just kind of got to do what you can. What is the lifespan on the painted lenses? Um, 77% normally a year, but it's, it depends really how much they wear them, how, what solution they end up using, because you tell them to use one solution, then they get the cheapest. So. <laughs> but the other one I got blue saline. Is that the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> I had one guy make their own saline. Oh wow! Oh, <laughs> Thrifty. <laughs> but yeah, I think because a lot of these patients have, you know, an opaque cornea or something that's quite obvious, um, they do really push the wear and time. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, they're getting all day out of the lenses, so they don't last quite as long. And what's yeah. the like learning curve on getting them to like the teach on them? Is it much more difficult than just a standard contact? With the 22, the, so the, the large soft lenses, um, generally they can't actually see the lens quite as much because they're sort of looking down and trying to put it under the upper eyelid. Um, so it's actually, the lens is more intimidating, but the process of getting it in maybe isn't quite as much. Yeah. Um, but the issue is always the men. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know. Women are quite used to working with their eyes, um, whereas the men just, you know. I remember you, you were doing GP practice, and this was just after I had my laser, like a couple of months down the line. So they'd ordered my GP lenses from pre-laser pre -laser K measurements, not post-laser. So my cornea was really flat now. And uh, literally, I remember, I'm, I flinched like crazy when someone tried to touch my eye anyway. My friend literally had a knee buried in my chest, trying to ram this little GP lens in my eye. It was not funny. <laughs> yeah, Good I, practice I, for bad patients. In my pre-reg, I had a bouncer. So I, I, I had a, a pre-reg in central London. Yeah. And um, th this guy came in and he was a beast of a man. Yeah, he, was, he was like six, seven, six, eight. And uh, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't big, you know, but he was solid, right? Yeah. And he's come in and I've gone, ask, what did he do? And so I'm a bouncer. Okay. I think I've got something in my eye. Okay. So I just need to have a look. Okay. I just need to have a look under the lid. No, you can't touch my eye. <laughs> you're not coming in. I, I need, need to have a look. If you've got something okay. in there, you have a look. No, you're, you're, not, you're not touching my eye. You, you, you can't touch my eye. I won't let anyone touch my eye. I was just like... Okay, so I did literally I'd squirt in with saline and then see how you get on. If it doesn't work, off the hospital. <laughs> because what That's else can you do? Why? You know. Oh my, that was the thing. My friend goes to me the other day. So obviously, because we've got social distancing now, if we're going to flush someone's eye, can we just get a super soaker with saline and just from across the table to square it in until we've flushed it enough and then there, yeah, social distance, done. Okay. You, you know, I was, uh, wash, I was, um, jet washing the front uh the front drive uh today and yesterday and um what happens is is if, if you're not wearing uh safety glasses or, or wraparounds the muck can easily spray up and hit you in the eye um and i did think to myself there must be some genius who's done that got the muck in their eye and used the jet wash to no, wash the no. muck out of their eye. <laughs> there must be at least one person on the planet what, and take the entire cornea off with it? I think they'd probably enucleate themselves. The power these things have yeah, comes up. No. I, I saw something. Hey, if I wanted to have a shave, you could probably do it with a jet washer. <laughs> take your face Saying that, show me the barber. This isn't going well. I'm back at work next week. You sell some Alice bands, mate. That's what I just did. Uh, mm -hmm. Alice bands, tried that, broke it. I had to get some new ones. <laughs> Not obviously was today's thing. Um... Cat. I think I've got enough for a top knot. It's kind of just more dark brown right now. Look at this. <laughs> and it's a very poor top knot today. You boys just let me know when you want lessons. Yeah, I'll oh. let you know. <laughs> no. Rock a park. Yeah, man. How do you, do you use BIO, Kojin? 
Uh, I'm not actually practicing at the moment. Just for a second, I thought that's some sort of new turban style. I was like, what? <laughs> okay, back to optics. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. No, um, I'm, I've actually been furloughed. Uh, I'm going to be going back to work next week. Okay, uh, no, think... but in, in terms of when you work, do you use a headset at all? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I've never, I've never used one. Okay. Yeah, um... but, I, but at the moment, they're uh, talking about... Um, <laughs> The uh, facial, we've got facial shields for when I do go back to work. Yeah. And because the facial shield will sit across here, I would actually have to tie my turban very differently so it goes a bit over the ears and a bit more rounder in order for the band <clears throat> to go around. Right. Um, but yeah, this is my- e turban, it's gonna be a thing. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, the uh, Del Boy uh, invented one with a crash helmet in uh, Only Fools and Horses all the years ago. I'm sure I could uh, design and patent something, you know, Supply Gajan, and demand. Gajan, the youngsters are going, what? I know you think. Only fools and horses, what? The only thing they know about only fools and horses is Del Boy and yeah. Rodney falling. <laughs> trigger. I know the yellow car. That's about it. You should watch. It's a fantastic episode when he, when he creates that helmet. Yeah. That urban helmet. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Erica, what's going on with you? When do you think you'll be able to return? Um, so Tommy called me a week ago and they're talking about like late July but it depends when we can actually go back into their houses and then they'll come in in Wales hopefully next week or two weeks but it is just waiting game right now just sitting tight and uh, have, has it so has anyone apart from the guys in hospitals have, have, have you guys done any PPE stuff wow. oh me yeah at all get some practice in because pe putting PPE in and taking it off Oh, no. I mean, I, I ordered some prior to lockdown and yeah. I had two masks then in clinic, um, but I've not had like the full gown. I've just got like a couple masks and the other stuff. Yeah. We've got all Monday to practice as well. So Monday we're not seeing patients yet. Yeah. And then I've ordered my scrubs as well. So my scrubs should come on Friday. All black. Put on scrubs. Huh? All black, Hamza. I wish. No. For now, Navy, until I can get some black ones. It's hard to get hold of them. No Gregory, one's got them. Um, Gregory, I'll message you. I just got mine today. They came um, all black. Oh, that's nice. But, yeah. but for now, Navy, until I can source some all black ones, definitely. Don't you have to have green? No, never. Corporate green. <laughs> oh, do I wear the Specsavers uniform either? No, never. <laughs> Not going to happen. No, we don't have scrubs in hospital. Um, you don't have scrubs? No. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> the luxury. <laughs> So we have to, um, we got given scrubs because I work in air casualty as well. Um, so obviously that's me, apart from urgent diabetics or maybe some urgent paediatric refractions, yeah. um, it's been mainly eye casualty patients I've been seeing. So for the first week we got given scrubs, um, but then the COVID wards got too busy so they took the scrubs to COVID wards. So now we have to go to work in one set of clothes, get changed to work clothes, oh. and then like when, when you leave, leave those at work and get changed back. Well, this is what we got told for practice as well. So I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm not changing my suit into then joggers and a hoodie to go home. Just would leave scrubs at work. I was like, it's fine, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love it at the minute. Shorts and t-shirt, walking to work, you know, wind in my hair, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Living the dream. You go in and start wearing pajamas for whatever, seven hours, and then you get back to changing the shorts and t-shirt, you know. I like the scrubs. Hey, I hope they're here. Okay, hey, what's the. Glad you got um, dressed up for tonight, Zach. It's important for us. I had to put on a shirt. Glad you put a shirt on. <laughs> glad you put a shirt on. That's all I've got to say. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, what's the policy in your practice with that? Because I, I'm looking to reopen the practice in July. Yeah. And I have to make my own policy. <laughs> so I just thought I'd ask you, how's it going in your practice? So, so what we decided essentially was so what we used to do, we used to have what we call dress down Saturday where so monday to friday it would be shirts trousers shoes um saturday would be dressed down so you could wear jeans it had to be neat smart so like jeans and a t-shirt um and what we essentially because theoretically because we're going to be at work all day what we had done was we, we'd said to people you can wear dress down clothes because we know you're gonna have to go home and throw them in the wash if you're going home throwing them in the wash you, you know it's not practical with a suit because you know you're not going to dry clean a suit every day or you know things like that so at the moment um the team at the front of house are coming in in just maybe smart trousers and a t-shirt because you've got your apron over the top anyway um 
whatever safety wear you're going to wear, whether you're going to wear a mask or a face shield, goggles. I'm finding it really hard with the face shield because I can't then use this. I can't use a slit lamp with a face shield, and I, I struggle with red at the best of times. I was telling Hamza this, so to then do it through a face shield was even harder. So I got safety specs, and I just take it off. But we've gone for um, casual, but not. Not and you're much. and you're providing your patients with face masks, yeah, uh, and that's it. Face mask, um, and you know, there's hand sanitizers all over the place. Um, they can mm -hmm. if they want. If they want to wear gloves, we'll give them gloves. Um, check their temperature on the way in. We have a lot of policy. Um, weirdly enough, the only person who managed to um, get in was a rep. Um, and Holly's just had to leave us because her iPad has. Um, run out of battery um so we will catch up with holly later but um yeah so locked door policy but the, yeah a, a rep managed to get into the practice right up to the front desk and he's like hello hello and it's like why are you why are you he's like get out and he kind of you know dressed like everything was normal no face mask, no protection. I'm like, get uh -huh. away from me. I mean, <laughs> where did I go? Yeah, yeah. The day yeah, before he was in Andrews, and I saw somebody who I knew. And like, you know in the queue. And then literally I walk in and it's like, they're coming up fully for a hug. It's like, no, back the hell off. Stay away. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, on that point, okay, I just, um, because, you know, I'm going to reopen soon. I know the AAP have um, recommended that we avoid any procedures that might create an aerosol, like a, a blefix which we do in, in, in primary care. I just wanted to know um, if, if you do that in your practice and um, if you do, would, would, would that, you know, would your PPE change? So we, so we, so for eye pressures, we, we've always used eye care anyways. Uh, eye care and GAP. Um, we, we've, we've never had NCT. We've actually stepped away from Blefex to a little bit, quite a lot actually. We use a product that's available from Prolin called Zocular, okay, which um, is okra based, and um, it. <laughs> just gone. Just gone. Finder. You don't. You don't mean. Finder. Mean... What's going on here? That's what that's what Tom Bruce Gudgeon said. I know it. I know. Okay. It. So he's thinking. Yeah. He's thinking lady fingers. Okra based. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's Maybe. what you're thinking, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, in interestingly enough, so the guy who, um, who created... Wait, wait, wait. Just to go back, back. You, you do, you, when you say okra, that's not like an acronym for something. You mean like actual, like, okra. indie... Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, guy, <laughs> the guy who created it is an American ophthalmologist. Um, of the Indian? South, no, Southeast Asian origin. So I don't know exactly okay. where he is. You're going to have to explain to me how this works, Kea. It's, so, it's how it uh, Carmelo, it's absolute witchcraft. <laughs> it I sounds was, like it. <laughs> I was up at the practice and watched it, and I've I've never seen anything like it, honestly. Um, I think the guy's name care was if you're if I'm right, um, Bam, Bam Peter. Peter Bam. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I did it better really on there. Massage it in, and um, yeah, it worked worked amazingly. Absolute witchcraft. Hold on, oh, guys, guys. So is this, are you talking about like a, an actual okra? No, right. no, no. They're like into the lower phonics. I'm, I'm not going down to my local in. Indian supermarket and bu buying up, you know, kilos of, of lace. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> oh my gosh. They, they extract the juice of it and it, and it comes, it like, it, it, it's like a clear gel. And you apply it to the lid, you give it 20 seconds, and then with a firm cotton bud type applicator, you rub. Or naan bread. And or naan bread. <laughs> a bit of, a bit of bud jalakia um, chili sauce, and you just and you and it literally just wipes off. It is wow. awesome, and people tend to prefer it to Blefex because I, I don't know who has any. So I'm assuming, uh, Calm, you've had you've done Blefex on yourself. Um, Zach, you've had Blefex. Uh, no, I've just I've just seen it being done on other people. It doesn't look bad. Oh, yeah, Zach's a bit delicate. Zach's a bit delicate with his eyes. I'm a princess. No. 
but it just felt soft, and, and it doesn't irritate your eye uh, like the Blefex. I've had Blefex, and it just—it's really weird sensation. You can you can put up with it, but it just, you put it, a toothbrush in your eye, man. It's not. It's not. No. Um, Who supplies it, Kaya? Sorry. Who supplies it? ProLens has the license, um, so they're in based out of Switzerland. I'll put you in touch with Armin. Um, they're okay. the guys who have the, uh, the have the European license for it. You can get it directly from the states, but they're a bit less keen to do that because of the licensing that they. The witchcraft. Well, it's more to do with the licensing that they. Right. But they 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 do a whole series of products to then take home for blepharitis management. Mm -hmm. um, so I use it actually awesome. I use it at night um, before so, I go to sleep. It's quite fair. good. If someone comes in with, I don't know, moderate anterior blepharitis, and you, um, you know, give them the, the exorcism, clear it, when do you next see them back? Um, we, we would probably see them at about four to six weeks is usually um, okay. if just to give them a check. And, okay. and that's it, really. So we, 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 to a certain extent, we'll let them self-monitor. Uh, with things like, I know with blepex, they often suggest you get them in every, every six months. Come. Blefix, I, I, I see a patient after a month. Okay, just for review, then, right? Just for review, yeah. yeah. What about retreatment, Carmelo? It depends on the patient, but as standard, I see them after a month. If after a month I still see signs, then I'll, I'll repeat it again, uh, free of charge. Um, and then usually after six months or after a year of the first treatment. Okay. But I always tell my patient every, everyone's different and I have patients who um, don't have signs but they just love the feeling afterwards. Yeah. So I have, I have a couple of patients that are coming every three months for a Blefix. Blefix, that's yeah. got that weird looking Demodex demo piece. Wait, 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 wait. What? Yeah. Everyone. <laughs> Anatomical. I had to get rid of it because I had so many... Um... Sorry. What's that? <laughs> Hey, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna stop the recording. Oh right, sorry. We've, we've just fine. diversified a little bit. Um, yeah. and so whoever wants to go, feel free to go. We can carry on talking, Carmelo, about the blepex and, and stuff like that. But I don't think everyone wants wants to I think Gudgeon's hungry. He looks hungry. Yes. We've got we've got uh Raj Machol, so red kidney beans and rice. Lovely. Oh, lovely. All right. Thank you very Thanks much. Guys. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Hamza. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah. Good, Good to see you, Erica. Good to see you, Kaya. Hamza, Zach. I'm going to have to go, guys. Um, yeah. But really, yeah. really good talking to you. Kaya, we'll message about. Yeah. It's gone by quickly. Yeah, yeah it's gone by quickly, what? guys. Really enjoyed it.